Okay, this is now most probably how our classes were, are going to look like given that there are also people out there whom I realized spend time watching my YouTube videos and then using these videos for their field study subjects. And I feel like this setup is quite good for a classroom discussion. You, you just look at the, the arm of Thea, like where she is putting her hand. It's as, it's as if she's really leading on the table of this immersive view. Oh, uh -huh. see? The both of, it's as if they're just really li listening in a lecture. But I like it. So those who wanted to, to have a soft copy of the module, the soft copy is already available in, in, in model. It's, it's the soft copy of, a, of the lesson entitled Finding Answers Through Data Collection. At this point, we are going to have a discussion on ways by which, especially in PR1, researchers could get the chance of having the data necessary for analysis and interpretation. Of course, there are plenty of available methods and designs out there. When you do research, there's no limit to what data, me what method or design you could actually use. However, the researchers still are to, to place themselves under the question, which method works the best, given that that is or this is my particular goal or, or intent? Given that as a researcher, I have this desire, I have this wish, I have this goal, I have this aim to attain, what method or design should I use? Upon choosing a particular design or method, the researcher needs to understand that there are also plenty of techniques in order for him or her to be able to gather the necessary data to be proceeded into analysis and interpretation. Among these methods, the first one that we'll have this afternoon is an observation. If you look at your module, the context of discussing an observation is done only in two pairs according to types and according to methods. Let me start with the types of observation. In terms of the types of observation, there are actually a total of six. You'll find that there are only two in your module, no? but there are actually six. Let, let me start, of course, with what's found in your module. Observation can be particip participant or non-participant. If it is a participant observation, the researcher spends time interacting with the ones being observed. For example, I am a qualitative researcher and I want to determine the behavior of students when they study. So what I do, what I will do in a participant observation is I will, in, let, let, let's assume that I'm going to observe Leisha. What I'll do there is I'll interact with Leija from time to time while also observing what she is doing. Interaction there does not, does not just simply go with a mere conversation. I'll really do like, um, Leija, can I borrow your notes? Or Leija, can, uh, would you like to see some of the things that I wrote which you weren't able to write down in your notes? The interaction goes far beyond a mere asking or talking to one another what's the the goal there is there is this kind of relation uh, there's the kind of connection that has sprung out between the one being observed and the researcher doing the observation there is an involvement on the end of the observer towards whatever the observed people are actually doing if you have a participant observation, that means that you can also have a non-participant observation. A non-participant observation would mean that the observer, in simple mean, in simple words, is not involved in any way with whatever is being done by the ones being observed. So at this point, the observer chooses to be distant to act as a mere observer, just as a mere observer. No interaction, no communication happening between the observer and the ones being observed. You can also, uh, the ones that I mentioned, that I'm going to mention now are not anymore found in the module. You can also do an overt or a covert 
kind of observation. When I say overt, it's spelled as O-V-E-R-T. Covert is C-O-V-E-R-T. If it's an overt observation, the ones being observed have been informed that they are being observed. So they are aware. They have some form of knowledge that they are actually being put under observation. While the opposite to that is the covert observation. As it turns out, in a covert observation, the ones being observed are not aware, have no idea that an observation is going on. But here's my opinion behind these two types of observations. When it comes to a covert observation, the way I see it is we would see there the authentic or real behaviors of the ones being observed. If we do a covert, uh, an, sorry, if we do an overt observation where the observed individuals know that they are the ones being observed, there's a tendency there that behaviors might not be totally authentic at all. There's a tendency that the ones being observed will show a behavior, will show a particular action or will even give a particular response solely to please what the observer wants to see. For instance, observation, the researcher gets into a classroom to observe how students are doing inside an English class. And then because the students might feel conscious that maybe the researcher will think of them negatively, the, the students, the ones being observed, will become more participative than how they were usually in, an, or in, a, in a regular English classroom setting. So the behavior is not as authentic because of some prior knowledge that there, there is an observation and that they are part of the observation. They are being observed. Maybe again, they might show a behavior just to please the, observe, uh, the observer with what the observer wishes to get from the group. Another pair of observations, you can also have a structured observation and an unstructured observation. So it's structured, unstructured. If you have a structured observation, that means that you have a list of behaviors and that you are just going to wait when these behaviors will come out. If you look at your module, that's what you call an observation schedule. A document that has a list of behaviors the observer wishes to see from the ones being observed. The behavior may not come out right away. Yet, all that the researcher needs to do, all that the observer needs to do is to wait. To wait for when that behavior particularly, particularly comes out. Opposite to that is the unstructured, an unstructured observation. An unstructured observation does not have a predetermined list of behaviors. What it does is to have a situation and that the observer stays in that situation and picks on whatever is being shown by the ones being observed. So the observer in an unstructured observation relies on whatever comes out. For example, let's go back again to that example where there's an observer to a class, English classroom setting. If it were a structured observation, the observer already has a listed set of documents. And all that the observer does is to put a check. There's a checklist. That observing observation schedule is a checklist in itself. Students spoke with a clear, with a clear and loud voice. Okay, check. Hands were raised. Check. Students were called individually, check. Names were mentioned first, check. So all of those are listed down as behaviors predetermined. But for an unstructured observation where there is no list of predetermined behaviors, the researcher gets into the classroom and simply takes note of whatever comes out. And it's quite limitless. Limitless because beforehand, the researcher, the, the observer was not already limited to what are expected to be 
found. So you have those six kinds of observations in to total. Again, you have participant, non-participant, overt, covert, structured, unstructured. Sir, when we do observations, is it possible that we could combine them? For sure, that's highly possible. You might do a participant observation, which is covert and at the same time unstructured. Meaning, you as the observer will interact with the ones being observed. But you won't tell them that they are being observed. And you don't have a predetermined list of behaviors. So you wait for whatever behavior comes out and you later take note of them. You, you recall, uh, okay, the, these are the things that were said. These are the actions shown. You write them down. You take note of them. See? Three types of observations working at the same time. Questions regarding the types of observation. Sir, will we do observations in our qualitative research now? I'm not sure if you are going to really do an observation. However, try to take this suggestion. When you, uh, by the time you gather your data, the moment you interact with your respondents, observe their behavior. Observe their reactions. Observe their facial expressions. Because those would count. In a qualitative research, actually, those would count. Though you did not really play it from the very start that you wanted to observe how your respondents respond or behave while questions are being thrown to them. Just try. Try to still take note of how they are. Was it answered with a loud voice? Was it a strong answer? Was it given strongly? Because those would matter perhaps. The moment you try to understand why that respondent gave such an answer. For example, um, I'm going to pick up on the topic by Clarence and John. Clarence and John's research topic is about the life of a single worker from Baldi Farm, given that there is a pandemic and the pandemic has brought changes to their workplace. Is that it, John and Clarence? I think that's your pro research problem, no? So, on that end, on that end, what if, what if the question was, what are the changes in your workplace right now? And then one respondent gave a strong response. Huh? So many of us have been laid off. I was even about to be laid off from work. And I didn't see the reaction, the way it was said is one that you should take note. That is worth noting, and it should be noted coming from your observation of that respondent. So don't lose, don't, uh, don't lose whatever it is that you will observe from them. Don't be too contented with the words that they just say. Also look at how they said those words. Also consider their expressions, their emotions when something was said. Besides, if they if they allow for, for a recording to be done, they just of course have to consider that their expressions will come up. If I'm not mistaken, all of you want to have a recording according to your scope of limitations. All of you want to have a recording done for your data gathering. So assuming that the, that the, the recording be a video recording, then at least everything can be well kept track with whatever should be observed from the respondents. There are also two methods in doing. We're done with the six types. We will look at the, six, uh, the two methods of doing an observation. The first method is a direct method, and it's quite simple. When people do the direct, oh, I see it's bigger there. When we, look, when we do the direct method kind of observation, you throw in a question. Oh, no, not, sorry, not the question. You, you throw yourself into the situation and simply you, you take note of what came up. Whatever behavior that occurred, okay, those are the ones that you need. 
Whatever it is that you had come for, whatever your purpose was for coming there, pick up on whatever is there and write them down. Take note of those that you have readily observed. That's direct observation. Um, look at uh, in terms if your observation if the purpose of your observation has something to do with how emotional persons are, then right away go into the emotions. Observe them. Take note of their emotions when they say something, when they express themselves. If your observation wanted to look at how siblings are in a family, then right away look at what's going on. Observation may be direct. That means that it can also be indirect. If you want to do an indirect observation, you will look at implied behaviors. Let me use the example that's found in your module. I don't know if there's one here. Ah, let me just come up with another. There's one, but let's try to have another example. Uh, let me use the question, the, sorry, the topic on sibling relationship. Let me use the topic on sibling relationship. You wanted to determine how good sibling relationship is in the family. So instead of instead of observing just the siblings or the ones who are in a sibling relationship, you will look at other things to speak of sibling relationship, the goodness of sibling relationship. For example, you will look at the, 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 the body of the ones you're observing. Do they have scratch marks? Do they have bruises? Ah, there are none. So they, they, they don't hurt each other. See? You, didn't, you, you are not just sitting there to look at one, one sibling and another sibling interacting because that's direct. That's too direct of an observation. You will look at the ball. You will look at the, the the younger sibling and the older sibling. You will look at their body. And there are no bruises. Yeah, I think they are not hurting each other. Siblings. Another one. Oh, you look at the clothes of the siblings. Other uh, their clothes seem fine. Wait, the clothes of the other one seem so tattered. What happened here? Is it probably because of how she or he was treated by an older sibling or younger sibling? Yes. Let's look at the projects. Let's look at the out the school works. Wait, the work of this sibling is not well done. Was it because it's not helped? The, the, this is not uh, this this sibling is not helped by any of the older ones. See, look look at where you are driving your observation. You are looking at other implied evidences to speak of the reason why you're doing the observation. And there are two ways to do indirect observation. You can do it as CM or continuous monitoring, or you can do spot sampling. Continuous monitoring is an evaluation of how people deal with each other. So this is really to be kept track from time to time. The monitoring has to be quite the monitor, because this is an observation, the monitoring here is behavioral in a sense, meaning you'll have to really strongly keep track of what happens. Spot sampling could either be by time allocation or experience sampling. When we do spot sampling, there is like there is one instance. There is one moment. There is one particular spot. Think, think of that moment as like a snapshot. It's like one incident from that moment that you are doing an observation. You decided to focus on one particular instance. There could have been something so triggering in that observation. And then you process the information you'll get from that observation. So again, in the, in the, in the long time that you have done your observation indirectly, there could have been something so striking in one particular moment. So you focus on it. You have made that moment stand as the sample of the entire time that you were doing an indirect observation. There are good things and kind of downsides when people do observations. To start with advantages, observations actually would come out to be yielding simple data. 
I find that to be quite an advantage. It's quite a good advantage that the data here is quite simple. Simple to the point that it depends on what you are able to note, to, to note down. It is objective in a sense because there is the observer here cannot just change whatever came out because the observer depends on whatever was presented to him or her. I mean, if you really want to follow the good intention of an of a, or the good conduct of an observation as much as possible, you would not want to influence the ones you're observing. You still want that their real selves really come out. I mean, no matter the occasion, no matter the purpose, those, those who are under observation should show the real behaviors or versions of themselves under observation. And that definitely will make the observation highly objective. One disadvantage in the use of an observation is that it, it definitely requires a long, a, long, a long time to process. It does. It's not as simple as uh, I'll observe a group now. There are plenty of considerations to be put in mind. Sometimes you'll have to consider the vulnerability of the group you are observing. What do I mean by that? You might observe a group who finds itself to be too timid to be observed. And that might result to inadvertent or perhaps unauthentic behaviors. And we don't want that. That would defeat the purpose of doing an observation. Well, again, as much as possible, we want the observation to yield authentic behavior. Another disadvantage is the one that I mentioned earlier. If the observation, sorry, if the observation turns out to be over, meaning announced, there is a possibility that the ones observed or the ones being observed will show something that is not really a reflection of who he or she is or, or who they are. So the acting side simply. Uh, sibling relationship, sibling relationship. And then uh, let's let's assume, let's assume Leija is going to interview, uh, observe, not interview, sorry. Leija is going to observe Teya in the study of sibling relationship because Teya are siblings. So Leija informed Teya ahead of time. Teya, I'll be staying in your house for a span of one week because you are going to be my test, uh, you are going to be my respondent or my participant in my qualitative research. Upon knowing this, Thea went home and then she told her family, especially her siblings, Oi, I have a classmate who will be with us for one week. Huh? I do not want her to think that I don't have a happy family. I don't want her to think that my family is really catastrophic or chaotic. Bunil, be sure that in that week, Whatever it is that I ask of you, you do it. Adeline? Uh, how do you call Ad Adelai Adeline? Ate? Ate Adelai? Ate, ate. Ate? Try to bring me some, some, some things when you get back from work. Ma? Pa? See, look at what Thea did there. There seem, I, I know that it's far flung from what Thea will do in her family. But I tell you, Something like this could happen in an announced or in an overt kind of observation. Because again, that is the, the ones being observed would not want to be thought of differently or negatively by the one doing the observation. So when Leja stayed there, you can just imagine you know, that in that in those requests or those demands made by Thea, there could have been plenty of conflicts in the family. Like there could have been, it could have been pretty chaotic on a regular day. But they, Leija came to do the observation for that week. Guess what happened? When Leija entered the room, all that she saw were smiles in the, in the among the siblings. Then things things played as how Thea had told Bunil and Adeline of, of her demands. So Leija noted things that came out from her observation that, that were shown. Only to find out that 
those are not really the authentic behaviors that could have really observed, realistic, could have been re realistically observed in, in a day to in a regular day basis in the household of Thea. Why did it end up that way? Because it was an announced observation. It was an overt observation. I don't know if I've told you this, but I've had students before in another school who did a kind of visit to the Bajo community here in Totolan. It, it, it was not the intention to do an observation, but the Bajo community is also one vulnerable group. So what they did there was um, it, it's uh, yeah yeah I think part of their data was to also take note of how uh, of, because their study was about health health, health practices. Their study was about the health practices of the people in the Bajau community in Tutulan. For sure, uh, that kind of matter is sensitive to discuss and much so to be observed. What the researchers did, because it 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 would not be right. To, yeah, I think it would not be right to really inform this right outright to the ones being observed. What the researchers did was to send a letter to the barangay captain of Tutulan and to the chief of the Bajau community. So there are two persons, two individuals at least. I think they also sent a letter to the mayor of Dawis. There are at least two individuals who got informed of this, of that research thrust. It's not totally, uh, it's not that the researchers went there and violated the vulnerability of the group, no. The researchers went there with the approval of the chief of the community, local community, as well as of the barangay captain. And yeah, I think they also got the, an approval from the mayor, from the municipal mayor. So there were already there are already offices that approved of their observation of their research. Things would have been entirely different if they were if they really told this to the ones being observed. Who knows? Who knows? They just might really do their health practices instead. Any question regarding observations? An observation, by the way, is one tool, just one of the many tools that you can do to gather data or to collect data. If there's none, let me proceed to the second tool. The second tool is for a while. I have a message. Ah, there's a. There's a to those who are having internet problems, this might just be the one you'll see in your. Ah, I cannot see my phone. As of this time, I can only see Faya, Leisha, Rain, and. Fiona, Fiona. What does it mean that? The others are just names. For every 10 degrees increase. Errol, you turned your camera on earlier, so I know you can turn your camera on. What do you mean? Well. Clarence, you have turned your camera off as well as I see, but you turned your cameras on earlier. Please try to turn your cameras on, people. Next tool. The next tool here is the interview. And I think all of you. No, we'll do an interview. Interviews, of course, involve two individuals. You have an interviewer and an interviewee. And they come in several types. You might do... I Okay, I see. You might do an interview which is unstructured. If it's an unstructured interview, you just simply throw in questions for the purpose of stirring the mind or jogging the memory of the one you are interviewing. There are, there's no list of predefined questions that you intend to ask. You just wanted to, but of course you have a topic in mind. For sure you should have a topic in mind why you are doing the interview. But there's an absence of a list of questions that you should have prepared ahead of time. For example, uh, I'll pick up on one of your topics, building confidence by Thea and Kiana. So in an unstructured interview, the both of them should, of course, keep in mind our interview will be about how students build confidence. So it's possible 
that Thea will have her own interviewee, Kiana will also have her own interviewee. In Kiana's interview, she went first with, are you a confident individual? But Thea's first question in another interview went differently. Thea's first question was, how would you feel if you are placed in front of an audience? Do you feel, like a con do you feel confident in front of that group? In the first place, these two just had a common, the uh, a common theme or topic. But they never had a common set of questions to ask to their respondents. So what happens there is, there's a very big possibility that both will, uh, at the end of the day, both will have varied responses. Varied in a sense that themes are not reconcilable. There's nothing quite common with the responses obtained by Thea and the responses obtained by Kiana. Because then again, we could trace it to the lack or absence of a list of questions. But this kind of an interview still exists. This interview is really meant to stir the minds and the memory of your interviewees. You may also do a semi-structured interview, which is what you are probably doing in your PR1. It's semi-structured because you are aware that there is already a list of questions. Where can you see your list of questions, Leija? The zone of inhibition. Statement of the problem. Correct. Your SOP contains your target questions, right? The target questions you have, in, you have listed in your SOP are the ones which could address our statement of the problem. However, for sure, when you do your interview, you won't limit the conversation to those four questions. I could recall, you stated in your scope and limitations that you'll provide probing questions. Are probing questions already listed down? No. Is it, is it even practical to have a list of probing questions? No. Probing questions are called probing questions because you feel the need to ask them in order to, to make a respondent in, or in order to make someone give more of him or herself to the question that you just raised. So there's not really a definite list of what probing questions you should ask. In fact, uh, let's go back to Kiana and Thea's example. Thea's probing questions may be different from Kiana's probing questions. Let's, uh, what's your question number one, Kiana? Or Thea, what's your question number one? Okay. So that's it. Again, sorry, sorry. What are the factors that build the student's confidence? What are the factors that build the student's confidence? Ah, what are the factors that build the student's confidence? Okay, so that's the question number one. Only to find out that when they raised the question to one participant, the one respondent, the respondent gave only two answers. I feel like the family and the, these were the like Taya interviewed me and my answer were answers were family and friends that just that but Kiana asked Rain Rain what would you consider to be the factors of how you would build your confidence Rain's answers are I think the family is one because the family is a good support system they are with you through thick and thin. They're the ones who could immediately be with you regardless of your, even if you succeed, or even if you don't succeed on what you're trying to do. I would also consider my friends to be, so look at what Rain did there. Rain's answers to Kiana's question are really explained. But look at what, my, look at what I did to Taya's question. All that I did was to say, Family, friends. So definitely, Kiana will not anymore ask Rain of a reason for thinking of these factors, for giving these factors. She will not anymore throw in a probing question for that. But Thea might do it for me. 
They might then ask me later on, what made you say the family is a good factor to build someone's confidence? And then my, my simple answer is, it's because they are there. And then Thea makes, makes a follow-up. Why? What, what could be the effect if there are people who, re, who stay with you? See, already two questions. But Kiana has not given a, a probing question yet to Rain. So that's the beauty of this unstructured, semi-structured as an interview. You, you already have a guide. Guide, not just a team, but a guide in terms of what target questions should be answered. Not to mention that along the way, you'll be giving in some more probing questions to help solicit more substantial answers and to drive the conversation into what you want as a researcher hopes for for your study. Then the third type of interview is the structured interview. Just think of the structured interview as a researcher holding a questionnaire, but you are not looking at the questionnaire. All items there are being asked to you. For example, uh, my, though I'm interviewing Yona. And then my first question is, uh, how often do you eat chocolates? Option one, ma'am. Twice a day. Option two, four times a day. Option three, I don't eat chocolates at all. And then Yona picks an answer from the choices I provided. That makes it really structured. Because the, 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 the interview already has its limits to what's to be asked, to what are to be asked, and to what answers are available to these questions it's not anymore open for for discussions coming from the interviewee it won't anymore go as far as when they when let's assume let's go back to that biona will say i don't eat chocolates at all there's not anymore any room for why what happened why don't you uh, no the question the follow-up is not necessary in a structured interview, it proceeds right away to the next question. Uh, okay, you don't eat chocolates. Question number two. See? That makes it structured because, again, the list of questions is already displayed. All the more that there are already possible answers. Again, it's as if you, are, you, had, you have just been handed a printed questionnaire. It's just that, a printed paper with questions and options. It's just that. The items there are being read to you, making it a, a tool in an interview. Approaches to doing interviews. You can do an individual interview or you can do a group interview. You can also do a mediated interview. Of course, individual interviews would suggest that it's just you and one interviewee. Interviewer, interviewee. In fact, this individual interview is in a face-to-face -face setup. Face-to-face, -face, yes. You should really see each other for the purpose of that interview. If it's a group interview, same thing, face-to-face, -face, but it's just like you and the rest of the ones from whom you shall get an answer. For example, a group interview. I will go into your... Let, let, um, let's consider that everything is in a face-to-face -face setup. Face-to-face, -face, huh? I will enter your room. As all grade 10 students are my respondents, I'll enter the grade 10 room or grade 11. Sorry. As all grade 11 students are my respondents, and then I'll float in a question. For perhaps the first question is, who supports you in your study right now? And then I'll pick up on people to give answers. The interview was done to the entire group. The mediated interview is what you are actually going to do. Most probably, especially if your parents will not allow, if your parents do not allow you to leave your house for the purpose of collecting data. A mediated interview takes place through electronic communication or through electronic means. 
To those who plan to do interviews using Facebook's video call, that's mediated. Those who plan to do it using Zoom, that's mediated. Sir, what if I call someone over the phone? That is mediated. Even if it's not a video call, even if it's a mere phone call, for the fact that there is an intervention of a particular electronic device or some electronic means, the interview has been mediated or bridged. Therefore, mediated interviews do not happen on a, on a face to face setup. I hope that by the time you look at your scope and limitations, you will expand it now. Because for sure, what you'll do there is not just an online interview. There is a better term coming from the module. You will now call it a mediated interview. Never mind. Call. I think it's all right if you won't state it as the researchers are going to do an online mediated interview. I, I would suggest, I would suggest you don't do it as an online mediated interview. You better state it as the researchers are going to do a mediated interview using whatever it is that you're going to use, using Facebook Messenger. That right away denotes that it's online. Using Zoom, that still denotes that it's online. What shall make it redundant is when you say, the researchers are going to do a mediated online, an online mediated interview using Facebook. And that makes it so redundant. At this point, again, we know we should know better of the right term. We will call it a mediated interview, not just any interview. Unless, unless there is one of you here, there's one group here who will do an interview on a face-to-face -face setup. Lorraine, will you do a face-to-face -face interview, Lorraine? Yes, sir. Ah, if you do a face-to-face -face interview, then of course, you won't call it a mediated one. You'll do, there's a better term, you'll do an individual interview. Sir, is it possible that I'll do combinations of these interviews? It's fine. Maybe with one person where the per your parents are, your parents is allow have allowed you, or maybe the person is in your proximity, you can say with one participant, you're going to do a face to an individual interview because that's already counted as face to face. With other participants, you'll do a mediated interview. And you'll, you'll do a mediated interview using whatever application you can use. Steps in conducting an interview. The very first step is that you should get to know each other. Part of getting to know each other for the purpose of an interview is that you contact the person to be interviewed. Sometimes, for formality's sake, a letter is even required. Not just sometimes. In most times, for formality's sake, a letter is even required for that purpose. There are really others who would print a letter and would have that letter sent Take note that it's not just a letter sent online, but it's really a printed letter sent to the office or to the person with whom the inter interview will be conducted. And take note, the sending of the letter is not right away the assurance that the interview will proceed. We cannot right away say that with that letter, the interview can then happen. It's still open to the possibility that the interview be turned down because maybe, just maybe, the person to be interviewed is preoccupied with far more important things. Or the person to be interviewed finds the matter sensitive or too controversial. In that letter or in that Notice, of course, you're sending, requesting for, a, for an interview. You'll present what the topic or the theme of the interview is. Whosoever finds the topic to be confidential or too sensitive or controversial can decline your request. Last year, there was this plan of, of us of preparing a letter. But the letter did not push through. 
the students though still managed to do the gathering of data. But it so happened that last year there was none for qualitative research. The data gathering they did was for quantitative research. Let's just see what's going to happen this year. But if the letter should be made, then we will re really make the letter. Sometimes, especially if you are pressed by time, the letter pro the let the letter could probably take a portion of your waiting time to a too great of a portion of your waiting time. So what people also do is just to contact right away, most probably through a phone call, the one to be interviewed. And that's where the permission is, is going to be asked for. So may maybe you can do that. Even if you are, take note of this, even if you are friends with a person you're interviewing, permission is still a prerequisite. It is still of utmost importance that you get the permission of the person you are actually going to interview. And then the next step, you present the idea behind your research, behind the purpose of doing the interview. You have the idea, you share it. So you tell the one to be interviewed, you tell your interviewee what the purposes of your research, why that research, why that interview was even, interviewee was even picked in the first place. Why among many, that interview we qualified for the interview you should explain that is of course trying to also also give justice to that individual's involvement to your in your interview or in your research part of this step is you set the mood you should try to also set the mood Setting the mood means that you are not going to present an atmosphere where the interviewee would feel as though he is not safe and she or he is not, are, is not safe or secure. That's part of step two. Step three, the interview proper happens. So questions are raised, answers are noted, and so on. Oh, no, I don't know, sorry. Starting the interview, sorry, sorry. Step three, starting the interview. Starting the interview would probably include, include asking for preliminaries, preliminary questions. You may write down your preliminary questions. Probably, probably you already have a predefined set of questions as preliminaries. You ask for the person's name. That's part of the starting of the. That's part of starting the interview. The age, even questions like uh, how do you feel right now. How are you feeling? I don't feel any pressure right now. See, Janina San Miguel was placed in an interview. And what Paolo Bidiones did at the start is starting the interview. He did not right away go with, here's your question. No. There was a mood setting that he also did at the start of the interview. And then came the interview, or then comes the interview proper. Questions are raised, answers are solicited, answers are noted down, are noted down. the continuous giving of questions happens. And eventually, your interview will come to a close. In the closing of the interview, or as you are putting an end to the interview, please do not forget, you thank the interviewee for his or her time. You owe it to the interviewee to thank him or her for granting you his or her presence. At some point, at some point, there are even others who give out tokens. Sometimes people would give out gifts because the interviewee has granted him or her the interview that he or she, the researcher, really needed. Sir, in our case, sir, if we do an interview, sir, for PR1, should we give gifts that's not obligated, that's not a requirement? However, I, I don't know, but I don't know, but a part of me thinks that maybe if you approach one of your respondents, um, refusal of the elderly, Lorraine, to take vaccines. What if, what if Lorraine is going to request one of the elderly in her place? Uh, Manong, Manong, can I interview you for my research? And Manong will say, what's in it for me? What will I get from this? How much is this? Can I get 500 pesos from you? What? Personally, personally, what I would do on that matter is 
I would look for another respondent. I just have to explain. I'm sorry, sir, but I, I cannot give you anything right now. This is for the purpose of my research in school. And then the respondent might say, ah, never mind. I'll not grant you any answer because you will not give me something in return. Look for another individual. Besides, in a qualitative research, we don't do a sample of the entire population. We just need a minimum number of individuals. A minimal number of individuals. However, if your generous heart, if your generous heart would rather say, okay, sir, okay, okay, man, now I'll give you 5,000 later on. And a jacket. I'll give you a jacket. I'll also give you another, an, a, a, a my phone. All of these are sponsored by Kuya Willy. Oh. We, we, uh, if, who's, whosoever finds this video, Bekinemen. Sponsorship, sponsorship, Bekinemen. Sometimes, there are those who would end their interviews with a handshake. Yes. That's a good way to end interviews. That's quite an assurance that the interview ended well. As much as possible, we end interviews with both parties, meaning the interviewee and the interviewer having smiles on their faces, meaning the interviewer gets satisfied of the needed responses and the interviewee felt secure and safe and, and got assured of these safety and security coming from the researcher. Especially when it comes to matters that are quite confidential or too sensitive to be divulged. If we could let, if we could see our interviewee leaving the interview with a smile, I think you could say that your interview there was a success. Of course, in the premise that you really asked the right questions. And not that you were just playing along the entire time or having a pool of yourself while doing an interview. For as long as the interview was in good context and that the both of you left with a smile, I would say the interview was a success. Questions regarding the interview. Now imagine you doing your interviews. Imagine yourselves. Sir, I plan to do a mediated interview with someone. So you'll call someone, perhaps... I think your easiest means would be Facebook Messenger. Facebook Messenger, perhaps, no? Get the permission first. Even if it's just an informal message. Um, good. For, uh, for example, you are going to interview a classmate. So Viona might interview Leja. Send an informal request from Leja. Leja, can I interview you for my research, for our research? Because if Ray, Leja refuses, there's, she's already shaking her head. There's nothing that Viona can really do. There's just nothing that she can do. Also, also, try to be patient for the response. Try to be patient for the response. But practically speaking, we cannot wait for too long. Especially that for the purpose of an academic research, you are bound by time submissions. If it happens to be too long, well, in practice, notify me and then that's when I'll give you the permission to look for another participant to be interviewed. For the meantime, it's already 3.32, so I'll have to end the call. By the way, I'll, I've already checked all of your test papers. I'll mention, to, yes, all, check, all test papers have already been checked. All grades are done. Except for the by the time I put in your scores for the performance task, today your grades will be finally uh will, will be made final. However, I noticed that not everyone has submitted the PT for for what is this? For oral com and philo. Uh, PT submissions for a while. Uh, performance task submissions. Or Confilo. I only have the names of the following people. If your name has been mentioned, that means that your PT has been downloaded by me. Abergas, Bumidiano, Buntag, Kalipusan, Joaquin, Humalon, Larong, Mikotuan, Mulit, Subrevega. Names that have not been mentioned 
are those of students who have not submitted their PT yet for oral com and philo. And for that, that will be all for this afternoon. Goodbye and thank you, grade 11. Do not forget to hit like and subscribe. We are halfway there, people. We're halfway there. Anytime soon, we'll be able to reach the dream. Goodbye.